should also add a number of uh, things that people have given me to announce to the group. One, the lavatories are through that door. They're marked boys and girls. And this is a, a great school. Uh, this uh, evening's lecture will be taped by Sound Photosynthesis, and they will make the audio portions of those tapes available immediately after. There are also copies of uh, both earlier or of lectures by both uh, Robert and Colin from earlier occasions that you can uh, purchase. And we ask as a courtesy to them that you don't make any tapes on your own for their, for their service. After Colin phoned me last spring to say that his lecture tour around the world uh, would uh, allow a stopover in San Francisco between Australia and New York, I began imagining uh, a dialogue with him and Robert McDermott as probably the provocative highlight of his lecture tour. Uh, Colin is a prolific writer, and it's easier to uh, present his books in terms of their categories rather than the 100 individual titles. His most famous category, of course, is his uh, Outsider Cycle. And then there's his uh, studies in transpersonal psychology, his explorations of the criminal mind, the occult and the paranormal, literary and artistic figures. Uh, speak up? Oh, yes, happily. I wear these like a crown in my mouth. All right. Um, let's see, what was I doing? Itemizing Colin's accomplishments. Um, but in any case, in recent years, he was approached to author a series of monographs on specific brilliant and controversial minds of our time, including Gurdjieff and Jung and Aleister Crowley, Rudolf Steiner, of course, and uh, most recently, Spensky. Is that... That's, that's just come out, and uh, I haven't seen that myself yet. In these uh, books, he doesn't really adopt a position of advocacy. He thoroughly digests all the original writings of, of the uh, figure in question. I remember him complaining to me once when he drove from the airport that it took him two years to digest Jung's collected works, but he does indeed digest them. And then he presents uh, this perspective with a remarkable lucidity that's his trademark, and uh, a very genial spirit, balancing what he favors in the writer with honest reservations. So this will create the grounds for a, a genuine dialogue. Uh, Robert McDermott's uh, involvement with Rudolf Steiner reflects a very uh, different perspective in terms of advocacy. Uh, Rudolf Steiner represents, uh, for him, uh, the sort of the fulfilling end of a, a discerning survey of some of the seminal thinkers of our culture. Um, and having reflected on these, I believe he's settled on Rudolf Steiner primarily because of Steiner's keen innovations with education. Uh, his relation to Steiner, I would compare, is like a house with many windows. Uh, one looks out on the past, especially American philosophy. He's the only person I know that talks about Josiah Royce in an alternative graduate school like ours. But this is reflected uh, recently in his article, William James and Rudolf Steiner, that uh, is one of the articles in the uh, edition of Revision, a uh, quarterly journal of transformation and I get this right, I'll be, of consciousness and transformation, of which he's one of the five principal editors. Uh, oh, another window, and I would guess it's the largest window in his life, uh, looks out on education reflected clearly in his presidency of CIIS, uh, which followed two decades of education at Baruch College as chairman of the Department of Philosophy at uh, City University of New York, his current presidency of the board of the Waldorf Institute in Spring Valley of New York, and of the Rudolf Steiner College in Fair Oaks, California, and the Rudolf Steiner Summer Institute of Thomas College in Waterville, Maine. This is something what the educational equivalent to Colin's prolific writing. So, and finally, uh, One Window Looks Out on the East, which is reflected in the titles of the two main volumes he's edited, The Essential Aurobindo and The Essential uh, Rudolf Steiner. And in his upcoming public publication by Lindisfarne Press, Spiritual Thinking, Essays After Aurobindo and Steiner. 
So I think that uh, knowing these, these two men, I'd say they're essentially akin. They're both um, unapologetic advocates of the truly positive tradition of Western intellectual life. Both are cheerful and tireless workers, and <laughs> neither of them are what you would call laconic. So let's begin our lively dialogue with Colin Wilson and Robert McDermott. children are going to interrupt us in a few minutes, so I hope you won't mind if I wait for them as they come in. I um, explain in my book on China how I uh, first came to write about it, uh, which was in a condition of extreme irritation, having read some of these um, works. And um, when I was first asked to write a book on China, after I've written a book on um, Rudyard and um, another one, the one on Ale Alistair Coley, I felt, um, you know, I was deeply interested in him. When I tried to read him, I just could not get to grips with him. Um, I felt that he was the most awful writer I'd ever read in my life. You know, that Steiner just cannot write. It's woolly, it's vague, um, it's abstract. And, you know, I found it, honestly, difficult to understand how Steiner had, in fact, um, managed to captivate large audiences, which apparently he did. Anyway, after trying to um, read Steiner um, for six months, I gave up and I said to the publisher, it's no good, he is no good. <laughs> um, let's forget it. And... Um, Two years later, I got around to writing a book about psychometry, which, um, as you know, is the ability of certain people to touch objects and to sense their history. This um, first came about around about 1845, when a man called Joseph Rhodes Buchanan became interested in the fact that certain of his students seem to be able to sense the contents of wrapped up packages by simply touching them. He'd actually been talking to um, some Civil War general called P Polk. You call it Polk? 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 You've got a street named after him in San Francisco. And um, he said that he could always tell brass in the dark by the taste that he gave him in his mouth as he touched it with his fingertips. And Buchanan was so interested that he began testing his students on this kind of thing. And he soon found that a lot of them could actually test things by touching them with their fingertips. Then he tried wrapping them up in thick brown paper. And still, the students could tell what was wrapped inside the package. And he put all kinds of things like, um, you know, sulfur, um, salt, vinegar, pepper, and so on. And these students could infallibly tell as they touched the outside of this thickly wrapped package what was inside it. Now, what Buchanan concluded was that we have a kind of nerve aura around our fingertips, which can actually stretch through the package, just like your tongue, and tell what is wrapped inside it. Now, this seemed a perfectly good, sensible theory. But then he discovered that, in fact, people could pick up letters written by totally unknown people, touch the letter, and tell you about the character of the person who had written the letter. This proved to be so accurate that, you know, he was astonished. But what he assumed was that the individuals who had written the letters were able to, as it were, project a certain nerve aura into the letters in the way that, you know, we project our physical smell into whatever object we touch. 
and that certain people who are psychological bloodhounds can then pick up the smell. Well, this seems fine until he actually tried it with newspaper photographs, and it still worked. <laughs> so Buchanan uh, decided that there was something very odd about this, and um, he called it psychometry, meaning, you know, um, soul measurement. Now, I was fascinated by this, because obviously this was basically scientific, and obviously it really worked, it still works. After this, a pupil of Buchanan's called Denton, who was a geologist, tried wrap, wrapping up geological specimens in these same packages and discovered that once again, his students were in fact able to sense what he'd put inside the package. Um, for example, his wife, who turned out to be a very good psychometrist, could touch the package and say, um, I sense that this is... Uh, an ancient Roman. I can't tell you much about him, but he's large and fat. And um, he seems to have great authority. And then she went on to describe the Roman villa. And so on. This turned out to be the Roman villa um, of Cicero. And various other things of the same sort. Now, clearly, this really worked. But then, from then, I went on to Rudolf Steiner, who seemed to have this same capacity the same curious ability to touch things and to suddenly sense their past. Now, I knew that it worked with Buchanan and Denton, so I was pretty certain that you know, Steiner on the whole was genuine. I got so fascinated, though, by Steiner's talk about Atlantis and Lemuria that um, I decided to go into the rest of Steiner's books. Incidentally, let, let me make a brief digression here. Um, I promise I'll give you some time, Robert. This is all fascinating stuff because quite recently I got interested in this whole subject of Atlantis because Dino De Laurentiis asked me if I would write uh, some kind of um, film outline about Atlantis because he'd always wanted to make a big movie about Atlantis. I got quite interested um, in this whole subject and came across a piece in um, some journal that said that a man called Robert Schock from Los Angeles had in fact described the Sphinx as being approximately four or 5,000 years older than anybody had so far thought. The Sphinx is supposed to have been built, as you know, around about the time of the Great Pyramid of Cheops, which is um, 2,500 BC, roughly the same time as the earliest circle of Stonehenge. Now, in fact, uh, what Shock said and what had been suspected for a long time before was that the pyramid had been water eroded, which is impossible in ancient Egypt. And when Herodotus, the Greek historian, went to see the pyramid around about sort of 450 BC, he didn't mention the Sphinx. Now, you will agree that it's impossible to go and see the, the Great Pyramid and not mention the Sphinx. The reason was the Sphinx was buried under sand. And the reason clearly is that the Sphinx has been buried under sand most of its life. When Napoleon went to Egypt, only the top of the head of the Sphinx stuck out of the sand. Napoleon ordered it to be cleared. Within 40 years, it was buried again completely. The Sphinx has been under sand most of its life. And yet... It has this enormous erosion, which historians have always said is wind erosion. It just couldn't be. It looks as if the erosion on this is water erosion, which means that it's got to be a lot... Oh, come on, children. I told you my wife and family were turning up sooner or later. <laughs> you have to stand up. There's something over there. Um, <clears throat> which means that basically... The Sphinx must be several thousand years older than anybody has thought. Now, this is a total absurdity, because um, the ancient Egyptian civilization only began about 3,200 BC. And what's more, one of the odd things about ancient Egyptian civilization is that by 2,500 BC, in a, a mere 
um, 700 years, you suddenly have this incredible complexity of science, of medicine, of uh, astronomy, and all kinds of other things. It's just never happened before. Um, to me, the evidence seems to point very clearly to the fact that the Sphinx is much, much, much older. My guess is around 9,000 BC. And Shock um, from Los Angeles was a geologist, an archaeologist, agrees with this. Now, this is a very interesting thing because I'd always been fairly certain of the existence of Atlantis. And one of the things that I'd read about in Steiner was Atlantis and Lemuria. And the, my first reaction to it was, well, a lot of old rubbish. You know, he comes up with these weird, extraordinary comments about the past, which I was relatively certain are rubbish. Um, in here, in this book on Steiner, you know, I'm not waving this at you because I want you to buy it. The damn thing's now out of print. <laughs> um, in here, I talk about Steiner um, going along to England and looking at the site of Tintagel Castle. And Stein is saying Tintagel is, in fact, um, the source, the place where King Arthur um, had his Knights of the Round Table, and then giving a fairly complex description of the Round Table, you know, and of these people who lived on this giant rock on the north of Cornwall, which is where I live, and um, describing it in some detail. And in this book, I say, what bloody rubbish. We know that, in fact, Tintagel was built round about um, 1100 AD, you know, the castle on the rock. There was nothing. Well, you know, King Arthur, as you know, was round about um, 450 AD. He was a Roman. He wasn't an Englishman at all. He was um, a Roman who and was in England at the time when the Romans were being driven out and the time the Roman Empire was collapsing. And therefore, um, Arthur, as the final Roman general, stayed behind. Um, and then, of course, some stupid um, bloody uh, Anglo-Saxon king invited in the Picts and the Scots, who have always been absolutely poisonous in English history. And here my prejudices begin to emerge. <laughs> Anyway, the Picts and the Scots um, not only drove out the invaders, but um, sort of finally drove out the Romans, which included King Arthur and the Celts. They drove them west towards Wales, towards Ireland, and towards Cornwall. And King Arthur was supposed to have been driven to Cornwall, um, made his first, last great stand there, and so on. Now, all of this appears to be nonsense simply because um, the castle on Tintagel, which is supposed to have been built um, by King Arthur, was not built until something like 600 years later. This is all in here. <laughs> Steiner, after describing this castle in great detail and the round table and all kinds of other things, um, went on to say, you know, that King Arthur had gone on to conquer a large part of England and some of Europe. And in fact, since I wrote this book, archaeologists have been digging down in the castle at Tintagel and they've discovered that it was built around about 400 AD. <laughs> so, in fact, you know, Steiner appeared to have some extraordinary knowledge. He was a genuine psychometrist. He really did know. This um, strange faculty of his has always fascinated me. The odd thing about Steiner is that, um, as someone was saying earlier this evening, talking about Jack Kerouac um, here in San Francisco, and I began to think about Kerouac. He was the only one of the beat generation that I never met. He actually set out to meet me on one occasion. And a friend of his arrived and said, you know, Jack is three bars away and he's totally drunk. As I was supposed to lecture in a girls' school in St. Petersburg, I couldn't sort of hang around and talk to him. So I never met him. And it struck me that the same kind of thing was true of Kerouac that was true of Steiner an incredible success that hit him like a fist. This is what happened to Steiner after years and years of more or less being a non-entity. I mean, we think of Steiner as being a, an extraordinary man who from the beginning knew his own purpose and so on. But when you actually read Friends and biographers, you realize that he was very unsure of himself, that he started off 
born in a peasant family on the edge of Hungary in Yugoslavia, that um, he struggled on for many years, acquiring a kind of education. But the odd thing was that from a very early stage, Steiner appeared to have this peculiar psychic ability, which I frankly don't understand. I'm absolutely non-psychic. I just don't possess any such thing. But I have met so many psychics that I can't believe for a moment that it's nonsense. When Steiner was a fairly young boy, he was in um, a railway station when the door, his father was um, a station master, when the door opened and some stranger he'd never seen walked in except that she had a face very like the Steiner family. And the woman said to him, um, I want you to try to help me in the future. Then she disappeared. Steiner was too embarrassed to talk about this to his father. Yet he heard the next day that a close relative had committed suicide. Steiner always said that he not only had this curious psychic ability, which seems to have been an ability to blend into the landscape um, rather like Wordsworth, this strange feeling of natural, deep understanding of rocks and trees and lakes. That, um, in some odd way, he could feel what goes on behind the surface of nature. Now, you all know, and this has been the preoccupation of all my work from the outsider onwards, the problem of modern man sort of stuck in the present, in the sort of boring mediocrity of everydayness, like flies on fly, fly paper, unable to escape from this feeling of, as it were, boredom, of non-meaning, non-entity. This for example, is the basic feeling that you'll find in Sartre and Camus and Heidegger and most modern existentialist philosophers. Some people are born in such a way that they have such a craving for, so to speak, the inner world, for sinking deep inside themselves, that in some strange way they experience suddenly this sense of it, the immense meaningfulness of everything they look at. It began to become clear in the 1950s, in fact, when Aldous Huxley wrote that book, The Doors of Perception, in which he talked about the curious effects of mescaline on the brain and the fact that suddenly you see everything as intensely real, totally 100% real. And that normally our perception doesn't recognize things as real because we are so drawn back from reality, so to speak, our condition is of such low pressure, like a tire, you know, with very little air in it, that we don't, in fact, feel the reality of external objects. You need, you know, drugs or drink or a sudden condition of euphoria until you suddenly see the external world as a fascinating and interesting place. Now, what seems to me to be the essential about Steiner is that at a fairly early stage, he realized that by withdrawing deep inside himself, he was able to see the external world as this strangely meaningful place which human beings do not normally perceive it as. Without the aid of drugs or anything else. In fact, Steiner did it with the aid of geometry. He got hold of a book on geometry when he was fairly young and was so fascinated by it that he felt that this was meaningful. This was suddenly a statement about the real world beyond the ordinary world of the senses. Now, I want to, Robert, how long am I allowed to keep on before I let you speak? <coughs> well, we're going to be going back and forth after a while, so... Okay, five, five more minutes, and then I'll shut up. L let me just remind you about Arthur Kersler.
you, you all know the story anyway, but Arthur Kersler, when he was in prison in Spain and about to be executed um, during the Spanish Civil War, he was there as um, a left-wing correspondent and was captured by the fascists. Um, he said that in prison, in a state of low pressure and misery, he began to think about um, the proof that there is no greatest prime number. You know, prime number is a number that can't be divided by any other numbers without leaving one over. You know, so seven, for example, is a prime. You can't divide it by two or three, and so on. But um, the great proof is the proof that there are an infinite number of prime numbers. They go on forever, and that you don't reach a certain point. And this, this proof is extremely simple. I won't describe it to you because I don't have time, but... Basically, Kirstler began to write up this proof on the wall of his cell, and he said, as he wrote it out, he suddenly went into a curious condition of total relaxation and ecstasy, and realized that he'd suddenly said something about the infinite in terms of the ordinary, finite world of mathematics, and that he was drifting down this sudden state of total bliss, he said, down a, a river of peace under bridges of silence, he suddenly felt something nagging at the back of his mind and thought, what is worrying me? Oh, yes, of course, I'm likely to be shot later this morning. <laughs> and then he thought, you know, how trivial. <laughs> <laughs> now you can see that's what it's really about, getting up above our physical reality into a kind of bird's eye view into our customary worm's eye view. And this is the problem. Our customary view is worm's eye. We're stuck down on the ground. And it's a matter of getting out of that and so far up above it. And every time you get above it, you have this curious feeling of total reality. This is true. It's like looking down on a city from an airplane and seeing it from above and then realizing that on the contrary, in your everyday life, it's like lying under a chair when you're drunk and seeing it from below. Now, this bird's eye view is what it's all about. And here, briefly, is what I feel to be the real problem about Steiner. There are certain people who are natural psychics who naturally have this curious ability to withdraw deep inside themselves to become so absorbed in the world of ideas, which Steiner was, he was a brilliant intellectual, one of the great intellectuals of this century, to withdraw so deep inside themselves that they experience that curious sense of power, of insight. This is what Steiner wanted to say. And don't forget that Steiner was born in 1861 into a world in which materialism, scientific materialism, was the basic philosophy. Now, this must have been a real problem. I mean, I was born into the same world in 1931, and I've been fighting all my life against it. And then, to my amazement, after I produced my first book, The Outsider, in 1956, at a time when most of the intellectuals in England and America and elsewhere in Europe were communists and, and, and totally left-wing, and I seemed to be standing totally alone as saying, look inside yourself and go as deep as you can. And then in 1960, it exploded. Suddenly, everybody was saying this. The occult revival had come. In my little Cornish village, there's now a yoga group. <laughs> Everything has changed since then. And Steiner would have been so delighted to see this enormous change. But for him, he was stuck in the middle of it. And therefore, around about 1880, when he really began to think for himself, he was stuck in this miserable, boring position of total materialism. The odd thing, of course, is that, to a large extent, um, he became quite friendly with some of the materialist people, like Haeckel, who was um, the man who declared that everything in the universe is material. You know, when um, Steiner was giving one of his early lectures um, on th the notion that the universe is simply one thing, he was delighted to hear that Haeckel was giving a similar lecture they exchanged papers. What Steiner meant was the universe is spirit alone. <laughs> what Haeckel meant is <laughs> material alone. <laughs> and yet, he managed to remain enormously sympathetic to people like that and to people like Edward von Hartmann, who was a, a disciple of Schopenhauer, who basically d 
describe life as totally meaningless. You know, the world is will and idea, but nevertheless, Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, everything is meaningless. And you have this enormous tradition running from that time down to the present day into people like Sartre and Camus and Michel Foucault and Derrida and so on. The whole modern tradition has been basically totally negative. And people like Steiner have stood against it in the opposite direction. Now, Steiner stood against it because he was psychic, because he had this curious warm, I must emphasize, by the way, that, this warm feeling that came to him in moments of psychic insight, a sudden sense of the meaning of the external world, and that inside this external world, there was some immense meaning concealed, which he called the spiritual world. Now this, for me, is the essence of Steiner. And when I suddenly began to understand that, I also saw that it's the essence of his greatness. He is the only major thinker in the 20th century who has said this. Many others have sort of approached it in Gurdjieff, whom I still regard as the greatest man of the 20th century nevertheless died a kind of alcoholic and from eating too much. Poor old Steiner died of overwork. Trying to help people too much. Anyway, Steiner basically had this incredible success that started around about the age of 32. Frankly, I don't understand it, although I had the same kind of thing myself when the outsider came out and Kerouac had it and so many other people of our generation had it. You don't understand what happens. You're picked up on a wave that has nothing to do with you and suddenly you find that you're world famous in my case and also in Steiner's. Easier in my case because, you know, at that time in 1956 you could be translated into dozens of languages. Steiner had to make his way around Europe and gradually spread all over until he became a world influence. And then, you know, the problem. The fact that if you're too famous, you are torn into a thousand pieces because you can't, um, you can't handle it. Charlie Chaplin was one of the first people to discover this when he traveled from Hollywood to Europe around about 1914 and suddenly found people screaming at every station and then realized that it was bloody inconvenient. I found this with The Outsider. Fortunately, with my second book, they murdered me. <laughs> and in England, at least, I was suddenly pushed so far deep down that I've succeeded in surviving. And, you know, I'm seri serious about this. Robert, it's an absolutely basic thing. In the modern world, think of Salinger, you know, this enormous success. And then the problem of success. There's suddenly there are too many people who know you. So Salinger became a, became a kind of Greta Garbo, saying, I want to be alone. And this made him twice as famous and successful. So although he managed to retreat behind high walls, You've got this spotlight on you all the time. I felt it for the first year after the outsider came out. A sort of spotlight beating down on you. And then suddenly, to my immense relief, everybody said, no, he's a bloody fraud. He just imitates other people's books. And I've been allowed to work alone. And since I always believed that you've got to work alone, stand alone, and discover whatever strength you have from inside, this suited me perfectly. Steiner was one of the first people to really understand this. But Steiner was born 90 years before me with the result that he didn't know how to handle it and he was destroyed by it, which was an immensely saddening thing. I mean, he died young, he died at virtually my age. Nevertheless, he left behind this incredible body of almost unreadable work which fortunately 
people like Robert <laughs> have, um, <laughs> have been explaining to us ever since. And I can assure you, you know, that my feeling is that he is, after Gurdjieff, the greatest man of the 20th century. travel all night in his train to um, give another three or four lectures the next day. So he had his own kind of problem uh, in drafty trains and people hanging on him. And actually, Colin, I think, did not exaggerate the difficulty of being not only a famous person, but a spiritual teacher. A very, very difficult um, assignment to take up to be a spiritual teacher with hundreds even thousands of people hanging on your every word. You know, uh, Sri Aurobindo has a uh, quotation in one of his letters where he says, the last thing I want is to have tens of thousands of disciples, where he actually says useless people cramming in and reducing the teaching to a religion. <coughs> Bang! Blunt. Um, I'd like to uh, begin, actually, there and talk about Rudolf Steiner as a, I think I want to say, a sacrificial figure, as a figure who had all the problems that um, Colin has uh, ascribed to him. But I would like to give this, and actually almost everything else, a slightly different twist. Not the opposite, just another reading with two different people, after all. And we each have our own karmic destiny, history, path, possibilities. And so we have different angle of vision. Colin some, uh, frequently refers to himself as an open-minded skeptic. And <clears throat> that is the strength of the book. I think he gets as far as a person is likely to get within that perspective. And that, I want to say early on in this talk, may be exactly as far as you ought to get. Not everyone should get to the same place with any particular spiritual teacher. So this is one spiritual teacher. He happens to be the spiritual teacher that I try to follow. And no doubt many people in this room as well. But there are no doubt many people in this room who are not trying to follow him or anyone else. That is also an important karmic fact with important spiritual implications and kind of, um, let's say, possibilities with important spiritual opportunities. For example, it is possible to believe what Steiner says and thereby make considerably less, let's call it advance, if we can use that word, less spiritual and even esoteric advance than a person who, like Colin, is an open-minded skeptic, but does his own thinking. So you'll find a lot of thinking in his book, struggling, not just with Tintagel, but the whole phenomenon of what is Steiner? How did he happen? How did he come to see the interiors? How does he track souls? How does he read civilizations? How did he start out seeming indifferent or even negative to Christianity and then have this experience which puts him in the light of this, what he calls the mystery of Golgotha, this transforming event in human history? In each of these and dozens, hundreds, even thousands of decisions that we each make when we read him, we write our spiritual autobiography. So 
Collins' autobiography is right out there in book after book, adding to a hundred. <clears throat> what I would like to suggest is, if, is in relation to Colin in the evening and two approaches of Steiner, that I am not a, um, an open-minded skeptic. I think I'm open-minded, but with respect to Steiner, I am unfortunately not skeptical enough. We'll leave to Colin whether he is too skeptical, or just right, or skeptical on the right issues, which is really important. I am not skeptical enough because, in a certain sense, my open-mindedness may not be as open as it could be. But let's not focus on me. Let's focus instead on Steiner. Was he open-minded? I believe he was not only open-minded, but more important, he was clear-minded. He was a clear seer thinker. He was a clairvoyant, clear, no clear knower. Now, if I, just going back to me just for one more minute, if I were a clear knower, then I wouldn't believe what Steiner says. Unfortunately, I do, and therefore I'm not doing what Steiner said we should do. So, Colin making these wax, as he does sometimes in the book, a couple of times he says rigmarole, right? And so, let me use a few words like that tonight. Rubbish, yeah. rubbish, rubbish, that's the one, that's the one, <laughs> rubbish. Yeah. Though the particular rubbish, I think, came back out all right again in the end, <laughs> which is what Owen Barfield said. He said, I so often thought that I had Steiner mistaken. And then 10, 20, 30 years later, it turns out, oh no, that was the earlier castle, <laughs> or some such as that. That seems to happen to people. But anyway, <laughs> what I would like us to think about is not what do you make of Colin Wilson, or what do you make of me, or what do you make of these two views, but to what extent are we writing the best possible autobiography when we confront a figure like Steiner. Tonight it's Steiner, it could be Gurdjieff, it could be Jung, it could be all kinds of other people. Tonight it's Steiner. Are we reading Steiner in such a way that we are following his example to do our own clearest possible thinking? And on this point, Colin Wilson's book, Alas, Out of Print, is truly excellent because he puts Steiner, rightly, in that company of those figures like Swedenborg and Burma and Blake who see the inners of things. And we who do not see the inners of things then have this terrible temptation to... And therefore, what I would like to suggest, and this is my concluding comment so that we have time for comments so together, is actually Steiner, uh, Platonist and Aristotelian that he was, is, offers a positive account of the worm's eye view and the bird's eye view. And together they make a full view. Because unless we attend to the details Right here, such as the details of the lives of the children in the nursery class and the details of the lives of the homeless and the details of the lives of the people around the globe, different colors, different languages, different cultures, unless we attend to all of those specifics, then this bird's eye view is a luxury, but it's not grounded. And if we only attend to that, to the details into which we sort of land in this tight fist of karma, without having any of this quality, without having this eye quality, without having this large 
vision, then we won't know the real meaning of the particulars that we have selected as our karmic situation. So we must go from bird to worm, from earth to star, and see how those large, that large range has its own meaning, has their, have their own meanings, but they also have meanings in and through the human, which Steiner celebrates as the being capable of having the most specific kind of physical life and the most lofty, far-flung, imaginal, or spiritual vision kind of life. So he comes into the world not only to restore that balance, but to extend in both directions, to honor and deepen our commitment to the particular and to affirm and push, give a little push to humanity toward the vision quality, without which, as the book of Proverbs says, we are all lost. So we've left some time for questions. I've handed up already. So perhaps we'll sit for this part. One, two, yes. Yeah. In the back, yeah, one and then two. Could you stand when you speak, please, so people can hear you? <laughs> Sure, thank you. Well, we've had two contributions. We, many people know Rorick's work. It's very important. It's, spirit, it's spiritual art. It's visionary. It's mystical. Um, he's one of the significant figures. Um, as for your comment about indigenous people, um, of course I agree with you that the, the worldview and the spiritual experience of indigenous people holds together the things these two parts that Stein is recommending, and I'm, of course, celebrating. And you're right to say, well, what's the big deal, since they've been doing that all along. Um, and the big deal is that he didn't come into the world, or he didn't discover when he was here, a mission uh, on behalf of indigenous people, who, after all, had this combination. He came in relation, or he articulated a task and a spiritual teaching in relation to modern Western people who had lost the sense of the divine. Now, it's a very big and interesting question about whether in the process which led to that loss and the loss itself, something was gained that was tremendously significant. Steiner thinks that something was gained in the modern West. It had a terrible price tag, and it still does. But it is not an ordinary insight. It is a major consciousness change. Not everyone is delighted by it. Steiner himself was not delighted by it in all respects. But he wanted to make it clear that the modern, the, the history of the consciousness that led to this separation of the human and the natural in the West is, a, is the, the downside of another upside, which has to do with the creation of scientific thinking. 
not the only kind of scientific thinking, but a very powerful kind of scientific thinking, which he says has an important place in human history. That's the thing that's always fascinated me about Steiner. You know, at the beginning of my book, The Occult, um, I argue that most primitive people have a certain occult perception, um, as uh, animals also have. There's e enormous evidence um, that dogs and cats, for example, um, have perception, you know, of ghosts and this kind of thing. Now, primitive people seem to have this, and we also, the whole human race, had it at one single point. What we have done is to quite deliberately get rid of it, and because we basically don't need it. I cite in the beginning of the occult the case of the tiger hunter Jim Corbett, who was able to tell when there was a tiger in the undergrowth about to jump out on him. One night he suddenly discovered these footsteps had gone across the road as he was walking back home. Um, he wondered why he'd walked across the road as he went across a particular bridge. Examining the other side of the bridge, he found that the footprints of a tiger were there and the thing was lying there waiting to jump on him as he went past. Um, he needed it because he was a tiger hunter. We don't need it. And so what has happened is we've quite deliberately got rid of this sort of psychic perception, this ability to understand these problems. And we've got rid of it because you cannot have a genuine intellectual perception and this thing at the same time. I, I, in 1963, he took mescaline um, under the, the advice of Aldous Huxley, and the bloody stuff made me vomit for about two hours. And after I'd um, vomited for two hours, I suddenly went into a wonderful condition of universal open consciousness in which I felt gently happy with enormous waves of pure love rolling over me, and I hated it. <laughs> my, my feeling was, you know, get away. Um, I, my mind was open like that, and my mind is normally fairly good, and it's closed like that. It's precise and exact. And mescaline did the opposite to me. It spread me too wide open. I suddenly, I, I became psychic under mescaline. I had a distinct and precise impression that the village where I live in Cornwall uh, was associated with witchcraft. I've never been able to check on with this, but I knew this. I could see this. Now, a perfectly useless piece of knowledge. <laughs> and this is what I'm getting at. We have deliberately closed our senses like this, and that's what fascinates me so much about Steiner. He was born with his senses wide open, and unlike so many people born with their senses wide open, the primitives you, that you speak about who haven't succeeded in creating science in our sense. Unlike these people, um, he actually succeeded in really doing something. And this is the fascinating thing for me. I've got to somehow keep my senses closed, narrow. And what's more, in certain moments, I can narrow them so much that the intellect becomes a kind of laser beam that will cut through reality. There's the opposite of that wide open, which all primitives have, and which Steiner also had. So you can see why I'm very dubious about Steiner. He was sort of like this, and yet to a large extent he succeeded in doing this. Some of these books, like The Philosophy of Freedom, are extremely important philosophical statements. Robert is right to admire him enormously, and yet he was wrecked by this, completely wrecked by it. This is the part where we don't agree very well. <laughs> uh, um, we do have questions, but just quickly for the record. <laughs> uh, um, if Steiner is right, and if we even do a tiny bit of what he recommends, we will restore a significant amount of the clairvoyance we have lost. And we will do it in a way that is conscious and full of affection and service. So it will be a more deliberate. It will not be manipulative, or it ought not be, but it will be a more deliberate, so that we will be able to go from open senses to open thinking, to open feeling, to open will. And all of these capacities will be heightened, deepened, purified, extended by trying to recover not the same clairvoyance 
as earlier peoples, nor is it clear that people who are continuous with those cultures have the same powers. They may have powers that are similar. We're all evolving together, after all. This is a vast and complicated topic, but I have to say we're not, I don't think we're in the same place on that one. Please, um, Pira, and then in the back, and then, yes, your third, yeah. About Rudolf Steiner's writing, uh, I wonder what kind of speaker he was, and if that's reflected in his writing, if, if the writing is taken from a lot of notes, and why it is so difficult, and, and what part of it is translation problems, right. et cetera. Sure. Do you want to? I can do it if you want. No, you, you okay. do it, because I don't understand right. okay. why Steiner was such a brilliant <coughs> speaker and such a lousy writer. Right. Uh, I, I have a... Um, a possible answer. I, I have an answer you could decide if it's likely to be true. I think actually Steiner's writings on, are difficult, not bec primarily, they are be partly because of the translation, but I think they also suffer in the original. And I think they suffer in the original deliberately. I think Steiner wrote all of his major works, his foundational works, and we should be conscious that of his 350 volumes, more than 300 are lectures. So you could say, well, I don't really like the, the thought pattern here or whatever. Why didn't he revise this? Well, he didn't revise anything. He didn't even want them to be published. But after they were all being copied and mimeographed and sent around, he said, well, if that's going to happen, at least do a good job of it. He actually wrote about 20 volumes. And he wrote four or five that he really cared about. He wrote Philosophy of Freedom, which was the earliest one, and then Theosophy, Knowledge of the Higher World, and Occult Science. Really those four. That's how, how many I named. Those are the ones that he revised and really cared about. He said, these are what I'm trying to say. Everything else is an elaboration and an extension of it. Now, it, I believe, and I've had this confirmed by people who know more than I do, that Steiner was writing in a way which we could not breeze through. He was trying to write in a way which would virtually force us to rework the words, to stop and have the thought. He wasn't trying to be obscure. He was trying to make each thought a concept which was um, not so user-friendly that we wouldn't notice it. He wanted us to, know, to have the thoughts that he was having. And if we could have those thoughts, we could discover the thinker that's having the thoughts. Colin is very good on this. My feeling is uh, not quite that. And that my feeling is that basically um, Steiner was deeply influenced by Goethe from, from a very early stage. And if you try reading Goethe's conversation with Eckermann, you'll see that Goethe spoke in exactly the same incredibly complicated, difficult way, which we find very difficult to understand. Um, what Robert seems to be suggesting is that Steiner, rather like Gurdjieff, writing in Beelzebub's Tales of His Grandson, deliberately wrote in a difficult style. Now, it doesn't seem to me that that's true. I think that he got so used to Goethe's style that he naturally expressed himself in Goethe's style, and that this has been sort of fairly unfortunate as far as, far as the modern world is concerned. Okay, and th there was a question further. You were the third person. The second person is not there. <laughs> he left. Yes, please. Um, in the Clinton administration, and Bush before him, there's something called Goal 2000, where they have made decisions about what should happen with the American education system. Right. They're saying that our goal should be to, to be first in science and math by the year 2000. How do you think Steiner would have responded to that if you were here? <laughs> you, t you take that one, Robert, but although I, I totally agree with it. You totally agree with it? Yeah, I do agree that it should be science and maths. Oh. I'm a scientist. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure of the logic because you're a scientist. We should be first in science, but it's okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, well, surely Steiner would have had said that. Steiner started off as a scientist and a mathematician, and he felt this is where you lay your foundations. Go on to whatever you like, but start off with science and mathematics. He was like Bertrand Russell to begin with, far more like that than like Madame Blavatsky. His early works are sort of brilliantly scientific. Okay. Um, 
I think I would answer a little differently. Uh, I think Steiner would not say what we need is math and science. Um, a tiny anecdote. The eighth grade class, at, I think it was the first Waldorf school in Stuttgart, but in any case it was an early one. Um, it couldn't have been the only f three or four years for graduating classes, so <laughs> it was one or two of those years. And he would ask each student, what, what would you like to do? Right. And a student said that he wanted to design beautiful houses and schools, which makes sense. He lives in a house and he goes to a school. Steiner says, that's wonderful. But don't forget, we also need very beautiful trains and very beautiful machines. And I think this is typical of what he would have said. Mm. Of course we need excellent science and mathematics and excellent poets and painters and excellent mothers and fathers and, and politicians and, and budget people and lawyers and on and on and on. And I think he would have said, not that we need this or this or this or this, but what we need all of those things to be rooted in a healthy capacity. That is to say, imagination. So we all know that we can use science to threaten our planet, to dehumanize each individual life. These are, these are direct byproducts of scientific cap capability. They're also byproducts, more fundamentally, of a, an impoverished worldview and impoverished capacities. So what he is trying to do is bring about a revolution which enables us to develop capacity such that art or arts, sciences, maths, social sciences, and, and interpersonal relations all flow from the relationship between each individual and some the, the spiritual that dwells in the individual, in the plant, in the animal, in the stars, in the seasons, in everything that the child and the adult touches. So then the right kind of science would come if it's rooted in in a spiritual or imaginal worldview and capacity. Uh, can I just add a postscript there? Sorry, before. Let me just interrupt you for a second to say that um, one of your um, writers from San Francisco, Raymond Duncan, the sister of Isadora, um, went to Paris, and I um, lived in Paris for a while um, at Raymond Duncan's academia. Raymond was saying something very like um, what Robert is saying at the moment. Uh, what he was saying is, it's all very well um, to be a mystic, it's all very well to be a poet, but you've also got to learn to be able to mend a tap when something has gone wrong with it. And it seems to me that what Steiner did, somebody had once described Steiner as a grown-up romantic. And this seems to be the essential truth about him. He really did manage to swing his whole philosophy around from this early romanticism and mysticism into something thoroughly and utterly practical. Um, which meant that, in a certain sense, he was able to achieve an enormous influence. This is the real reason for his influence in the modern world. It's not due to his writings on the spiritual capacities of man. It's due to his educational system, due to his agricultural ideas. And this is the thing that I really admire about Steiner. Sorry, the gentleman at the back. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to introduce a, a topic, maybe, that will uh, either muddy up the waters or maybe uh, find a, a kind of medium Let's put it in terms of the opposition between uh, science on one hand and religion on the other. Reason on one hand and imagination over Steiner clairvoyance or clairvoyant powers or intuition and, and reason being not only a poet but a scholar. It seems to me that um, we need both. And it's unfortunate that in the new age you don't take a cue from uh, Steiner and people like him because reason and using your mind and the realm of the intellect seems to be out of spiritual fashion. Just clear your mind and uh, go off your heart and whatever mind has been programmed into your heart, uh, you'll get an answer and you can direct your life. Well, I think we need to recover Coleridge's idea of reason and Emerson's idea of reason, which is very hard to separate, by the way, from their ideas of the imagination. And I think what we need and need to remember is that reason for, like Plato, 
uh, one of a divine thing. It was given by Prometheus. This ele this element was fire. And so we need both dialectics and flights of poetic imagination. Uh, and I think when we get that, uh, maybe we'll bridge, we'll bridge this gap that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. We, do need, we do need both. Yeah, you put it in a nutshell. You couldn't have said it more precisely. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Yep. <laughs> we should end right there. <laughs> Don't say another word. <laughs> when do we end? My, Michael, you're in charge. Um, well, I, I don't mind. We let's go three more hours. <laughs> so, so what was, but people, well, just a minute. People should feel free to leave, however. And maybe we should give a, a, a prediction, Michael, so that people know whether they have to leave or they can be polite and stay a little longer. Shall we go? Can we go? It's five after nine. Can we go another ten minutes till nine fifteen? Oh well, let's, oh, let's wonderful. Let's, yeah, marvelous. Let's he's, keep going. he's trying to get rid of you. He gets paid anyway. <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask people who haven't asked yet, if that's all right, please. Yes, the person with the hat. I'm ready to go, but you can go first. Well, you, you need somebody like me to begin with. <laughs> yeah, seriously, you need the interpreters. You need the people who understand what Steiner is saying and what Gurdjieff is saying and what Jung is saying and to sort all this out because something extremely interesting is coming together. Obviously, what I'm saying in a way this evening is that Steiner fascinates me. He seems to be an extremely important individual, but in some fundamental way, he went wrong. It wasn't his fault. It was that he was born too early, and he was simply overwhelmed. And his problem was to express a sort of basic inner vision. And his problem was also that he was born in an age in, of total materialism, in which he diverted a terrific amount of energy to attacking this materialism. Now, in 1987, I produced a book called Marx Refuted that came up out in England, in which I said that communism would disappear over the next 10 years. I didn't believe it for a moment. And when it actually collapsed in Russia in 1989, I was incredulous, and yet I felt deeply inside I had my reasons. Now, Uspensky, Gurdjieff's disciple, wasted all his life in a frenzied fight against communism and a hatred against it. Wasted far too much energy. Steiner wasted far too much energy in this fight against materialism. It's all dissolving away. Big changes are coming about, interesting changes are coming about, and they're synthetic changes. That is, they're synthesizing all kinds of opposites. And so, in a way, Steiner is a sig significant figure that not necessarily very significant for us in the present, except for that one single message, which, you know, I do ask you to think about closely, because that's what he said as the essential. Think about it. He said, the spiritual world is inside you and inside external reality. Inside, not behind. Inside. Which means that in some funny way, Look, let me just read you this passage of Steiner that seems to me essential. In his book on Goethe, Steiner said, The truth is entirely overlooked that mere beholding or seeing is the emptiest thing imaginable, and that it receives content only from thinking, from our thoughts. When one who has a rich mental life sees a thousand things which are nothing to the mentally poor, and this, you know, is most people, this shows us clearly as sunlight that the content of reality is only the reflection of the content of our minds and that we receive from outside merely the empty forms. And then he adds, of course, we must possess the inner power to recognize ourselves as the creator of this content. Now, that's the edge we are on at the moment. 
we begin to push enough energy into our culture to somehow revitalize it by sheer drive and force, and what we don't yet recognize is that we are the creator of that inner content. And when that happens, something is going to happen. We should be over the edge. We should be into a new type of man that Steiner understood so clearly. Uh, yeah, um, I think Colin really puts that well. But I think we disagree a little bit in that I don't think Steiner wasted too much time combating materialism. Because materialism, as he was talking about it, is not a local movement. It is the definition of modern Western consciousness. I mean, so things like communism, but also capitalism. Our educational system, our understanding of sex and, and ecology are all sort of held in the most sort of rigid and counterproductive and contradictory situation because we can't do this, this entering into the inner, the spiritual, very well or sufficiently to really sustain it. So we get peak experiences, or we get insights, we get flashes, we get, wow. Yeah. But it's not enough to stop yeah. grabbing, mm. to stop holding, to be sucking up the resources of the planet. We can't get ourselves to stop doing that, even though we admit to ourselves that this is very crazy. We are very destructive people. It's embarrassing. It's grotesque. And we don't reform. Why not? Because of a kind of consciousness that he rightly calls materialistic. We objectify. We hold, we grasp, we try to own what ought to be free. That's a deep indictment of a whole consciousness. So I don't think he wasted his time at all. I mean, I think that's what the whole thing is about. People, there are 200 million homeless children because we are materialists. I don't think it's a local sort of misunderstanding. This is you know, a big time sickness. <laughs> this is major alienation. Um, Teed. <laughs> things that's always intrigued me about you, Colin, is that you're one of the few people who makes a distinction between science and materialism. I think an awful lot of hostility that's arisen um, in a lot of new age thinking about science is that they equate it with materialism. I'd like to hear you say a little something about what, how you see science and materialism as being different and why they're different. Well, don't forget that Rural Steiner was born within a few years of H.G. Wells, five years. And the both of them were absolutely fascinated by science from a very early age. Steiner started off by being fascinated by locomotives and then went on to machines and engines and so on. Wells was exactly the same. So in a sense, you would say that Wells and Steiner were running a parallel course for something like 30 years. Now, the interesting thing is why they diverge, and that is because Steiner had one particular temperament and Wells had another particular temperament. But Wells, nevertheless, saw the essential that Steiner was speaking about. In his autobiography, he starts off um, by saying, look, I'm bored and fed up with all these responsibilities that are crushing down on me and squashing me into the ground, exactly like poor old Steiner at the end. And saying, you know, there is too much weight on me from other people. And then he goes on to say, the odd thing is that from the beginning of time, all animals have been up against it. We've all been in this position of fighting just against everyday problems. And now, for the first time in history, you can say to a human being, yes, you love, you hate, you do so-and-so for a living, such and such interests you, um, but what really is your deep purpose? And he says, my deep purpose is this creation of intellectual notions. I'm an intellectual creator. And if you said to me, 
tomorrow you're going to have to give that up and do something else for a living. I would not want to live. I would want to die. And he went on to say human beings are exactly like the first animals who dragged themselves out of prehistoric seas onto beaches because the seas were too dangerous. But once they got onto the beaches, they found that they only had flippers instead of legs. And they couldn't stay on the beaches for very long. And soon they had to go back to this sustaining medium of the water because their legs weren't strong enough. And yet gradually, they developed legs to walk on land. Now it seems to me that what Steiner sees is this, that in a certain sense, human beings are kind of only halfway there. What they're doing is developing legs to walk on land. Now, Wells saw these legs in, in a sense, purely materialistic terms. What he saw is that the fish is a creature of the water, the bird is a creature of the air, and man is a creature of the mind. We swim and live in a mental element, <coughs> and yet, so far, we're not very good at it. And this is the reason that we're half and half. This is the reason for all this mess in our modern civilization. The reason that we are half stuck in the material world and half stuck in a world of vision and intensity. Wells saw this, and you can see that Wells's vision was fundamentally the same as Steiner's, and yet they appeared to diverge completely. Both recognized that the same essential should drive us. And what is that essential? It is the fact that faced with material reality, if you increase your inner pressure to twice its present drive, then suddenly reality will become more meaningful in itself, and you will begin to see inside it, so to speak. And that's what it's all about. Not merely, you, you see, we, Robert and I, <laughs> and Steiner, and every other person who's tried to think are doing their best to say to you at the moment, okay, increase your inner pressure and, you know, grasp what Steiner is saying and you'll suddenly see some kind of an answer. Now, the point is not merely to do it sitting in this room, but to do it tomorrow morning when you're, you're at work and to do it when you're walking home from work, to try and do it all the time. And this is the difficult part. Do it when you're walking in the street. Somehow, try to do what Steiner is talking about, which is, it's like pulling back a kind of spring. Think of a crossbow. The enormous velocity given to the arrow is due to the fact that the bow is pulled back so tightly that when you let it go, the arrow shoots like a bullet. Well, the mind, Steiner is saying, is capable of shooting like a bullet, provided you can develop this inner power to pull back the crossbow. And that's what it's all about, pure inner power. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, I like the ending. <laughs> uh, the part that I would like you to reconsider um, has to do with when you said that uh, humanity or mankind or human beings are uh, creatures of the mind, I'm not happy with that if it suggests in any way that we are not, I mean, absolutely, that we are not creatures of the earth and the air, and that the mind is creative with respect to our relation to the earth and the air, but our relation to the earth and the air are absolutely essential ingredients, not only to the mind, but to our spiritual lives. So, I mean, he does, you know, hundreds, even thousands of lectures on the influence of the stars, on the relationship to, to, the, to, to the physical earth. I mean, he classifies herbs, and he, and he classifies illnesses, and he gives lectures to physicians and to farmers, and he's worried about the, the, the nutrients in the soil, precisely because he's worried about our spiritual lives. So this is not, he's not an idealist. He doesn't think, oh, well, we live in the head, and therefore we don't have to worry about the earth. Because we have a mind which is capable of free thinking or Slave, enslaved thinking, 
it is incumbent upon us to have the best possible, most conscious, loving relationship to the earth, to the human body, to the stars, mm. to all of history, yeah. without yeah. which we're just sort of floating around. There's a question here. No, no. There was. Things that are underlying the comments that are there between you are saying that the senses are wide open and then they're narrow and minor. The issue of morality seems to be, and where we are in moral development, seems to be a pretty critical issue because what do we do with all this knowledge? How do we discriminate that which is valuable, truthful, versus that which may even be demonic uh, that also exists in that realm? And those are you know, questions to me that seem fairly important to consider. I mean, science is not particularly meaningful without morality. John, with incredible tactlessness, you dragged us back to the nuttiness in Steiner, which I have never been able to stomach. <laughs> um, as you know, well, you must be gone. <laughs> Come on back. <laughs> well, as you know, Steiner, at a certain point, described uh, developed what he called his Christology, in which he said that Christ was a central figure in human history. Then he went on um, to talk about the forces of Ariman, of darkness, and so on. Now, I must confess that with a certain amount of um, a, uh, a certain amount of insight into criminals over the That's past 20 years, I've so sometimes come to believe that they are driven to read those books, even looking for the relationship between Christ and Steiner's view, and. Jesus Christ in Orthodox Christian theology. This concept or this transformative force in world history, in Steiner's view, has a, an intimate and significant relationship, not only to Buddha and Krishna and to um, you know, spiritual traditions of Asia, but to all of humanity and all of the spiritual beings in the whole evolutionary sweep of human history. The, this, these two names, Ariman and Lucifer, for Steiner are forces or temptations or uh, powers which are out of balance relative to the needs of the time. So there might be a need at a time for a particular culture to become more material. Aurobindo writes about that with respect to India. It says it is definitely time for India to become more practical, material, and to give up the spiritual rejection of material and the historical. He, in other words, he is saying something like Steiner, there's been an imbalance. Something that is good in its own right, namely the spiritual, can be used to unbalance humanity at a certain time and place. Similarly, the material which is good in its own right can become out of balance, as it is in our lives, in this culture. So that the Christ, as Steiner talks about it, which was an experience that, sort of, that he first had in 1899, was that to his surprise, actually, since, as you point out in your book, he really didn't consider himself a Christian and was rather critical of historical Christianity and of the very captive, ideological, uh, colonial view of Jesus which existed in the European culture to which he had access. That is to say, the exoteric view of Jesus, which he doesn't recommend at all. But from his point of view, the, this Christ being is a sun being and is a being which is on the side of, of human love and human freedom. And there are parts of religions, and indeed it may even be the case that an entire religion could have as its primary purpose in human history the blocking of those two essential spiritual achievements, love and freedom. And we all, everyone in this room, has wonderful examples of how not only Christianity but other religions are clearly on the side of oppression and violence and stupidities of all kinds. That's not what Steiner is recommending. He is saying that there is a sun being that inspires the entire human project. And it is not at all clear that one religion or another religion is in any way in charge of that. 
And in fact, religions at certain times in certain cultures can clearly show themselves to be entirely on the wrong side. So we have to get past all of the baggage that we carry with us, and we all carry a lot, with respect to these religions. So it's, it's, it's whether, I mean, it's, I think you're quite right to turn your back, because if, if, if we confront this concept, and it really is quite problematic, I mean, in terms of our karmic situation, our history, or whatever else, it's much better to leave it alone and get from Steiner what we can manage. But if you want to get the whole package, should you wish to want to get the whole package, then this concept has to be dealt with in terms of something much deeper than what religions say. Since obviously there hasn't been, Christians have not embraced Steiner in, in that sense because he's talking about a concept a force which would require extraordinary personal discipline to relate to. This is not now a figure who is available for our colonialist purposes, but something which is exactly the reverse. So it's a very deep, complicated, and I admit, controversial subject to be continued. <laughs> no, because you've already spoken, and we're asking people who, have only, who haven't spoken yet. Um, it's in my book. <laughs> How did Steiner come to the... He was a herb collector. No, he wasn't the master. The herb collector led Steiner to the master. Um, we know the name of the herb collector, but that person Steiner met when he was 19, um, 18. When uh, Steiner was 21, he met the master. Um, he did not say who he was. It is possible that it was not a person who was incarnated, or it could be, have been a person who was extremely insignificant historically, but had as his job that task of giving Steiner his task, which task it was to go into the belly of the beast of materialism and to bring to the West the teachings of karma and rebirth, which it had lost. But the name, I mean, there are people who speculate, but it's not been revealed. Michael, you're in charge of these. Are we taking two more questions? Two more questions. One, two. Please. Yes, this, um, this strikes me as very much. And in fact, in the last chapter, I talked to some extent about Gurdjieff as compared to Steiner. You see, both of them strike me as having had this same problem, which seems to me to be the basic problem of the 20th century. Both of them, both of them realized that they'd got onto something incredibly important before the turn of the century. And the desire was to express this. And in a sense, it destroyed them both. Because the nature of the 20th century is that when you fling yourself into this Niagara like rapids, and you get swept over the cliff and you swept into the rocks below. This seems to me to be the basic problem of the so-called spiritual teacher in the 20th century. And I've, as I was saying earlier, even thinking of someone like Kerouac, it seems to me a tragedy that we can be so easily caught up and destroyed by this particular mechanism. Steiner seems to me to be a sad example. Do you know that in the 
last months of his life, Steiner gave, I think, something like, I don't know, was it 600, 900 lectures, four lectures a day for something like three or four months. It's enough to kill anybody. <laughs> and yet, you know, he had this feeling that you somehow had to pour it out. And this is really <laughs> what I want to say as my, my sort of final comment about Steiner. And that is that when I started reading about Steiner's youth, and his development, I was fascinated. All of this interest in... I mean, he bought Kant, he bought the Critique of Pure Reason when he was 15 years old and actually decided to read this behind the history book in his class. You've got to admire a man like that. You know, particularly since what he was reading was pure rubbish. And, and that having developed this enormous intellectual capacity... Um, he felt, Yeats said when he came to London um, as a teenager that he was like an old brass cannon um, full of shot, ready to go off. And Steiner was obviously like this when he came back to Vienna um, after he'd been in Weimar. And then he exploded and then suddenly he was sucked into this weird giant maelstrom of success which I find the weird and fascinating thing. And for the next 20 years, it spun him around, and he did his best to swim in this tremendous thing until it finally drowned him. The same thing seems to have happened to Gurdjieff, except that he managed to carry on much longer with the aid of brandy. <laughs> and, and yet even so, when he died at the age of 73, and they slit him open... The doctors were amazed and said he should have been dead ten years earlier. He was completely rotten inside. <laughs> now, this seems to me to be the fascinating problem of the thinker in the 20th century. How is he going to avoid this particular fate? I was lucky to avoid it by being hated by my own nation, the British, from about 1957 onwards, with the result that I lived peacefully and quietly <laughs> without people banging on my door. How Robert manages this, I don't know. <laughs> but he has a problem in the 20th century, a totally destructive problem. And I see Steiner as a sort of appalling cautionary tale of a great man eventually destroyed by forces that he didn't understand. Just a, a tiny, we're not going to get to that, but a tiny footnote. The, uh, Michael Flanagan, who arranged for Colin and I to do this together, has been trying to get um, Jerry Needleman and I together. And Jerry and I are friends. It ought to work, but it hasn't, because um, we do discuss this. And, but just for a little warm-up, um, a recent publication, um, Modern Esoteric Spirituality, published by Crossroads, has Jerry's article on Gurdjieff and my article on Steiner. There's also, the ones, there are also Burma and Paracelsus and uh, Blake and uh, Theosophy and etc. It's quite a good read. Um, the last question. Could you stand if people could hear you? My question is about the significance of Steiner. Um, rather than viewing him just as a passing figure, perhaps seeing him as a foundational figure, um, if you speak on this, of a new form of spirituality, um, what that form might entail uh, in terms of the possible reconciliation of Eastern and Western currents of spirituality. Do you see that as a factor in what he was involved in? Want to do something color? No. Well, I started off myself as deeply involved in this idea of Eastern spirituality. The greatest single influence upon me was the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and it still seems to me the greatest of all religious books. Uh, Steiner was deeply influenced by Madame Blavatsky, who in turn was deeply influenced by the Hindu and Buddhist tradition. So that Steiner himself was very much a part of this tradition. The interesting thing for me is that at a certain point, notably in 1889, 1899, um, Steiner broke away from this tradition, and although he remained a member of the Theosophical Society for a while, gradually broke away into his own tradition, which in a way said the important thing is Western thinking. It may appear to be drawing us into a kind of whirlpool, but this is the opposition that Arthur Kersler later made between the yogi and the commissar, two people on absolute opposite sides of the fence, and yet the recognition that if Western thinking can recognize its potentialities, then suddenly it's going to embrace 
Eastern thinking too in some sort of vortex of intensity that would go completely beyond the sort of meditative, open notions of Eastern thinking. In other words, the sudden recognition that the personality is not evil, that it's the instrument, as it were, of divine intervention in human affairs. Now, that seems to me to be essential of Rudolf Steiner. <clears throat> yeah, I th that's good. Um, I, um, from my point of view, that's, we're pretty close. But um, I'm just a little bit nervous about this, that the West can really do it, can really include everything that needs to be included. It doesn't seem to me likely. Um, we can do much better than we have. We have very, very powerful uh, capacities to work with. But it does, if, if I'm reading the, all the currents, it, the capacities that we have are so caught and have been caught for so long in violence, in opposition, in antipathies of all kinds, that it doesn't seem to me that we can, that even the very peaceful, beautifully sort of feminine, mystical, transformative elements in our culture are sufficient to civilize us, to make us measure up to anything like the spiritual capacity that we need to save ourselves and the planet that we're destroying. So it does seem to me that the, the view, the look, to Asian spiritualities and to indigenous spirituality and to feminist spiritualities in all cultures is urgent, desperate, without which I think we are so dominated by our kind of um, divisive kind of thinking that it will all be too late. And so I think that the the best understanding of Steiner, which may be true as well, is that he really is that large. But I suspect that we will not discover that largeness from his writings or from the works as they existed at that time. It will only be by doing to anthroposophy or to what spiritual science, what he generated, the same kind of thing that he had in mind with this Christ impulse, namely to celebrate love and freedom and sacrifice everywhere and not privilege any culture or any thinker, including him. And I think that's what he would have preferred. Anyway, I think we've come to the end of our time. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Very well. That long hearted. Yeah. <laughs>